so what I want to talk about today is the some basic principles of data management that Microscopy Australia uh, proposes, more not as principles that we want to enforce, but more as a framework for all of us to work with, um, all of us being the facilities and um, the universities and the users um, of the facilities, whether they are researchers or students. Uh, and it's, sorry, not working. Yeah, um, so first a brief introduction about uh, Microscopy Australia. So Microscopy Australia um, provides, it's an increased facility that provides researchers with access to the nation's largest range of high-end microscopes and specialists. Um, we are a national network of microscopy facilities with nine primary facilities and nine affiliated link laboratories. Our open access policy means that you can access any of our facilities um, or whether they are um, facility like nodes or uh, link laboratories, regardless of the institutions um, you are based at. Now, if you look at those, very briefly, those statistics for uh, Microscopy Australia for last year, you can see it's many instruments, hundreds of instruments, it's thousands of users and almost 1500 publications and like hundreds of thousands of beam time hours. So you can assume it's a lot of data. And yes, it's a lot of data. So Microscopy Australia has seen the, the need to, um, to work on data management with the facilities and, and the users to, to, to have a framework for how to basically encourage good practices in data management. And in the environment of data management, in Australia in particular, there are also things that you may have heard that have been in the air for quite some time, the fair data principles and open science and how all of that basically articulates and what Microscopy Australia does of all of that. And this is something that I want to um, talk about today. So it will be general principles, not so much like the nitty gritty details, but it's general principles uh, so that we all uh, understand the same thing and we all uh, have in a way the same language when we talk about open science and FAIR in particular. And uh, so Microsoft Australia and its facilities aren't alone. The facilities, whether they are nodes or um, link laboratories, are at universities. This is our environment and um, they have users. Those users may be um, students, they may be early mid-care researchers, they may come from industry, they may have collaborators uh, from outside the country. Um, and um, at the same uh, at the same time, those collaborators may um, leave the university at one point, students who graduate, for example. So this is the environment that uh, Microscopy Australia and the facilities um, have to work with. Now, what is research data management? Why, what is data management? It's basically everything which is not analysis. Um, and it can be um, as diverse as um, Data storage, data storage, backup, archival, access to data, um, sharing data, license, li licensing and applying rights to data, uh, data collaboration, um, everything related to security, safety, integrity of data, the quality control and virtual contro controller of data, uh, transferring data, uh, making sure data is interoperable, um, that means that formats, for example, can, formats can talk to each other, uh, are compatible, and software, for example, can talk to each other. There's FAIR, I will go more about it later, and data formats, data standards, metadata, persistent identifiers, and there are many other aspects about, about data that would in, be included in data management. Now, why do research data management? It can help you work more efficiently, for example, by enhancing the reproducibility of experiments. It can be a way to ensure that you have good quality and integrity of your data. 
in particular, a very practical aspect is like you're not going to have data lost or corrupted for some reason. It can help you enhance the impact of your research, greater exposure of your data, greater access to your data can lead to greater reuse of your data. And as a consequence, increased reputation for you as a researcher, but maybe also as a for the facility that has supported you in your experiment. And it can be also where to call good data management also is required by some publishers prior to um, publication in particular preeminent um, um, publishers like Science, Nature and Cell. Um, now there are other aspects in data management, why it's important, it's a way to comply with legal, ethical and privacy requirements. For example, if you have clinical data, you have to make sure that your data, if necessary, remains confidential and is accessed properly. You don't want everyone to have access to those data. And also, very importantly, in our research environment, um, good data management is a way to comply with funding rules and partnership requirements. ARC and NCMRC, for example, have requirements regarding um, data management, in particular how long data can be stored and how it can be accessible. They can also have um, policies about um, publishing your data or making it available to uh, the wider community. Um, also, when you have collaborations with industry, for example, you, get, you, you may have requirements to maintain the data confidential. So this is something that I will focus a bit in, in, in this talk today is the funding rules because they really shape the environment that we're in when it comes to um, data management, in particular what is compulsory. And the funding environment basically is based on the Australian Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research, which, was a, which comes out of collaboration between the ARC, NHMRC and Universities Australia. And the code provides a framework um, for the responsible conduct of research and is based on very broad principle uh, which support high quality research, research credibility and promote trust in the research that is performed. And this code in itself um, has only broad principles. It is supported by many guides and there's one in particular about the management of data and information and I will give more detail briefly about this guide. So if you take the code and the guide in total, that's eight principles for research integrity, 13 responsibilities for institutions and 16 responsibilities for researchers. And together we form a framework for a responsible conduct of research when it comes to data and data management. And about data, there are three principles specifically related to data in the code. And out of all the responsibilities, there are four for institutions related to data and at least one for researchers. And they outlined and sometimes detailed uh, quite in a lot of detail in the guide. Now, very briefly, what sort of responsibilities um, do institutions have when it comes to data management? So the guide states that best practices in data management facilitate the justification and verification of the outcomes of research. It maximizes the potential for future research and it minimizes waste of resources um, for researchers and the wider community. It's a way to make sure, for example, that your data is not going to be looked, looked at only once, that you can optimize and maximize the impact of your, of your data, but making it reusable. Very specifically, the responsibility of the institutions is to develop and implement policies and provide facilities and processes for the safe and secure storage and management of data. That means that they need to provide guidance on a number of items and address them very specifically. For example, ownership, stewardship and control of data. How are you going to store, retain and dispose of data? How are you going to ensure safety, security and confidentiality? and how the, the institution is going to uh, ensure access to the data by interested parties. And the institutions also have to provide training for researchers and facilities for the storage of data. So the very practical responsibilities for institutions. In exchange, the researchers also have responsibilities and the researchers are committed to publishing and retaining for quite a long time their data or a time which is long enough um, according to the funding um, rules. Um, Versa are committed to managing confidential and other sensitive information, to acknowledge 
the use of others' data, and they also have to engage with relevant training when it comes to data management. Now, very importantly, for the code, a researcher is a person who conducts or assists with the conduct of research. That means that if you're a um, specialist in a, in a facility um, who assists researchers in their experiments, in their research, then you are also a researcher. So those responsibilities are also um, on you. And researchers, um, the guide is very clear, researchers are strongly encouraged to develop a research data management plan. Now, what do funders expect out of the code and the guide? So I, I'm just describing expectations very briefly for the NHMRC and the ARC. And they all come from the code because to be able to receive funding from the NHMRC and ARC, you have to comply with the code. So the ARC, until last year, encouraged data management planning. Since last year, you have to have a data management plan. Not necessarily, you don't have to provide it at the time you're submitting your proposal, but you have to have one prior to the commencement of the project. The NHMRC so far is only encouraging data management planning, but it's very possible that soon um, it will follow the lead of the ERC in making data management plans mandatory. Now, I've talked a few times about the FAIR guiding principles, and you may have heard from the ARC and the NHMRC that it's, it's better if you have your data FAIR, but you may not know what FAIR is actually, which is in a way very FAIR. Um, so FAIR, co FAIR comes from, so the so like foundational paper from 2016 about the FAIR guiding principles. And FAIR is an abbreviation, for, it's actually an acronym for findable data, accessible data, interoperable data, and reusable data. It's a sort of like standard that has become internationally recognized. So for example, the NIH in the US and the European Commission um, in the EU um, take FAIR very seriously and they are required in applications for funding. It's a technology agnostic. That means that you don't need to have specific software. You don't need to have specific products. You don't need to have specific data formats to be able to apply FAIR. It's discipline independent, you know, in a way, and it's not in a way, actually. If you do STEM, if you do engineering, if you do biological sciences, if you do arts, if you do humanities, if you do material sciences, FAIR is applicable. It applies to both data and metadata. So metadata is basically what describes data. It's the information on data. And FAIR applies to both human readable data and machine readable data. So you can have a binary file, you can still apply FAIR on a binary file. And you can also apply FAIR to a NASCII, to a text uh, file. So very briefly, what is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data? So I'm, uh, I'm taking those descriptions from uh, the webpage of the ARDC, which is the Australian Research Data Commons um, that describe FAIR. Um, findable data means it, you describe your data. You give it a persistent identifier to be able to, to locate it uniquely. And you make it findable through discipline specific or generic routes. So for example, if you're doing electron microscopy um, or if you're doing microscopy in general, and um, you're in biological sciences, for example, it's better to use um, repositories that are quite well known in the field, such as the EM Data Bank, EMDB, the Electron Microscopy Public Image Archive, Empire, or the Image Data Resource, IDR. But you can also set up your own server, and as long as you can maintain it over time, it's fine if you want to put your data there and refer to that server in your publications, for example. What is accessible data? That is often um, misunderstood. Accessible data, accessibility is a whole spectrum. It, it goes from open access to closed access. And what's important is that you deposit your data in a, repos in a repository. And if, for example, your data is closed or partially closed, we call that mediated access, you have rules how to access them. That is accessibility. If basically you make data behind uh, sort of like uh, a wall and you give the information how to be able to access the data by you know who by giving the information who to contact or for example which software to use that is fine that's accessible data but there are rules to access the data interoperable data means 
you try to use a standard file format and you try to use a community agreed vocabulary and you link uh, relevant information to your data, um, for example, in, in metadata. That means that you try to avoid or you try to avoid, for example, exotic file formats, because that means it may be very difficult for someone who has this exotic software that produce these file formats to be to be able to read it. So if you stick to standard file formats, for example, then you maximize the interoperability of your data and more people can read your data. So for example, if you do structural biology, the PDB format became very standardized very quickly. Um, and now all structures of uh, proteins, for example, are in PDB. Reusable data, I think it's pretty clear, but basically what you, things that you need to care about is you give discipline specific information about the output. If you have data coming out of an experiment, it may be good to know the setup of the experiment, uh, for example, the temperature of the experiment, the nature of the sample that was used. And you give information on how the data were created too. So, um, so you know, which software you use, which information, which version of the software you used, maybe which settings of the software you used. Um, so all of those information are very useful. If someone wants to reuse your data, they have to know where the data come from. Now, what do funders expect when it comes to FAIR? It's, they are mixed, um, mixed expectations. And so far, there's nothing mandatory. It's mostly encouragement. But for example, the NHMRC expects that there is a level of FAIR in the way you're managing your data. It comes from its open access policy. The increase, for example, um, in its guidelines uh, does encourage to embed FAIR in the way that research data are managed. So Microscopy Australia being an increased facility and the facilities being associated with Microscopy Australia are strongly encouraged to um, try to work within a FAIR compliant framework. The ARC, for example, encourages FAIR, but there's no specific policy regarding FAIR. The ARDC has an online tool. If you want to assess, for example, um, how fair your data is, um, it can be very interesting to see um, how far you are in the process to have your data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, now, I can see clearly there's maybe a question about fair data and open data. If you make your data fair, does it mean that your data is open? So let's talk briefly about open science or open scholarship. So basically open science is about STEM. So science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. Open scholarship is broader than open science by including arts and humanities. The philosophy of open science is that you make research and all of the artifacts associated with your research that includes publication, data, samples, software, and dissemination of your research accessible to everyone. And everyone means amateurs and professionals. And open science can be basically, you have a declension of open science, for example, open access, that may be the best known because it's publications, but open access, open data, open notebook, open source for software, open research. Citizen science is open science. Um, it's also sometimes also referred to as open to society. Now, what's important is that open science is has a dimension which is more about philosophy, moral, and ethics in research. FAIR is not about that. So are FAIR data open data? Absolutely no. Why? Because FAIR does not mean open. It doesn't mean free data either. Accessible means that your data can be accessed under well-defined conditions. So you have open access, mediated access, or closed access. You have the whole spectrum, and you put rules and how the data can be accessed. That means that data that is public, that comes out of research that was publicly funded. So for example, ARC, NHMRC, NCRIS funded data, they can very well have restricted access. For example, because of privacy, because of national security, um, confidentiality, or just competitiveness of the data. And the extent to which any piece of data is available, 
or advertised as being available through the metadata is entirely at the discretion of the data owner. And you can have part of the data set that is open access and another part of the data set, data set that is closed um, in access. So whereas open science is more, has a philosophical and ethical dimension, FAIR is a process for accessing data, whether it's automated or manual. Now, I've talked about research data management in general, the FAIR guiding principles and open science. Where does Microscopy Australia stand um, in this environment? So data management is supported or mand mandated by the code and as a result by the funders and all universities. The fair guarding principles are supported or encouraged by funders and some universities. And open science, aspects of it, mostly open access, for example, and open data, open data are supported, encouraged or mandated by the ARC, NHMRC, and some universities. What does Microscopy Australia do between all of those um, injunctions? Microscopy Australia basically encourage and enable good practices towards FAIR. This is what we're aiming for. And to do so, Microscopy Australia has developed a framework for research data management, which is based on five principles. And those five principles Considering what I've talked about from like the code and the guide uh, associated with the code and um, the fair data principles, those five principles, they're quite logical and there's, there's in a way I'd say there's nothing new under the sun. The first principle is have a research data management plan. Second, define who's the data owner, the data steward and or the data custodian in your facility, in your university, in your organization in general. Identify and document data as the third principle. Four, preserve data quality and integrity. And far, five, ensure that your data is, has proper storage access and security. And if you want to have more detail about this framework based on those five principles, you can contact me and, and I will communicate you um, this um, policy framework that we've worked on and which is now the foundations for all of our data management at Microscopy Australia. So brief description of each principle. What does it mean for you? What does it mean for a user? What does it mean for a facility? So first principle, have a research data management plan. Each like following basically recommendations from the ARC and the NHMRC and also from the guide associated with the code for responsible conduct of research, each facility is encouraged to develop a research data management plan. And each user should have a research data management plan and each facility is encouraged to make sure that that happens. And a user can be an early maker researcher, can be any um, senior researcher, can be a student, a honor student, a PhD student. And what's important is a research data management plan is a living document. You update it whenever it's necessary. And what can you include in your data management plan? For example, everything about your data, how it's stored, how it's accessed, um, how long it's going to be stored, maybe at the facility, um, when it's going to be archived, when it's going to be deleted at the facility, um, what's the, the conditions under which the data were acquired, for example. You, you, can, you can, for example, follow what the RC recommends for the data management plan, but you can include many, many things in a data management plan. Second principle is defining data ownership, stewardship, and or custodianship. Um, and I think that can be, depending on your organization, that can be very important to know then between, for example, the university, the facility, the microscopy facility and the user who is supposed to do what. So develop definitions or seek definitions from relevant stakeholders within your organization for data ownership, stewardship and or custodianship. Um, and know what they mean. Um, what is a data owner supposed to do? What's their role? What's their responsibilities? And if you have third party involved, don't forget them. They may co-own the data, for example. 
identification and documentation of data. The idea here is to develop tools and procedures to identify and document data using metadata and persistent identifiers. Um, metadata can cover many things. They can cover, for example, user ID, who generated the data, who acquired the data, what was the project ID under which the data was acquired, uh, maybe who operated the instrument, what was the temperature of the experiment, what was the sample, where did the sample come from, which software did you use to acquire the data, which software did you use maybe to um, handle the data further. Um, you can include a lot of things in metadata and in a way the sky's the limit. Now, be realistic too, because it can take some time. If you need to implement tools and procedures, it's better because then you you're doing it automatically instead of doing manually. Um, and whenever possible, try to basically um, capture metadata and persistent identifier, added identifier automatically, not manually. Like one way, for example, to capture metadata is through um, the booking system of your instrument at your facility. Or it can be by using an electronic notebook that all of your users have to use when they come to use your instrument. You can capture heaps of things through um, a notebook and a booking system. Fourth principle, preserving data quality and data integrity. Here's the idea is let's try to have a minimum basic data quality standards. And let's try to make sure that all the data uh, generated will meet those requirements. And that will enable data re reusability and data interoperability. So for example, you could, you could say, let's try to use a minimum number of data formats so that you don't, you don't have all like hundreds of data formats to deal with in your facility. I know easier said than done, but that's, that's the philosophy. Whenever possible, use standardized, publicly documented, or well-established disciplinary data and metadata definitions and formats. Don't try to use, don't try to create your own. Basically, you know there are some well-known metadata schema, well-known standards for metadata and data. Use them. That will definitely ensure that your data can be reused. Develop procedures and workflow to validate the integrity of your research data in dataset. So for example, make sure your data does not, like you don't miss chunks in your data and then your data is basically useless. Make sure that the data, for example, does, does not get corrupted over time and make sure that your data, for example, is accurate enough during the experiment. And very importantly for the facilities, determine what data to store and when the data needs to be archived or deleted. In particular now that like instruments could generate so much data, it may be important for you to decide which data you need to store. And at one point, you either archive the data or delete the data just to make data storage, data storage and data archival sustainable. Finally, fifth principle, research data storage, access and security. It's pretty basic, but I think it's important to highlight and to repeat, ensure that the storage of your data is secure and safe. Um, I wouldn't put a USB flash drive as a safe or secure storage of data. A memory card may not be very safe or, may not be very safe or secure either. Um, and ensure that access to the data um, is maintained by the facility until the management is transferred to the management of the data is transferred to your user. That's important to know, you know, sometimes you may have a, like this limbo when the data is generated, but who's in charge of that data? Make rules. Who is in charge of data until when? Uh, never forget third parties, for example, how they can access the data. Um, and if the data, for example, is confidential, don't forget about that. And ensure the security of research data. Uh, sorry, ensure that um, your research data is stored in a way that is secure and that best practices for access to data are followed. Like be, always repeat best practices. For example, no USB flash drives. Do, it's much, much, much better if you don't allow your user to get their data using a USB flash. Um, try to use, for example, the infrastructure of the university where you are or the organization where you are to be broader. Use the network, for example. It's a lot better 
uh, and most likely, uh, or you can hope, the organization will have put some um, investment in infrastructure to get good network connectivity between um, the instrument and maybe the endpoint uh, being either the desktop where the user is going to analyze the data or just the, um, des the, the desktop of the user where um, they're going to write their papers uh, in their office. So as a, as a conclusion, um, I just say good data management is great. We encourage it, but it's not a goal in itself. It's really a means. In particular, the amount of data generated by facilities, generated by instruments and facilities keeps increasing. So maintaining data longevity has become very challenging. Um, can you store everything? And if you store everything, how are you going to um, find your data, for example, find what is relevant data? And if you store everything, what's the relevance of data that is 10 years old? And I'm not talking about legal requirements about storing data. I'm just like, if you want to reuse the data that is 10 years old, how are you going to do that? You need to have systems in place for good data management to be able to find your data. Access to data, access to data, so it needs to be facilitated um, because it enhances data sharing, it enhances impact of your research, it, it promotes discovery and transparency of research. And fair data principles that Microscopy Australia promotes is a f just propose, proposes a framework for data sharing and that can enable maximum data use and reuse. So this is basically where Microscopy Australia stands in terms of data management and how we can, by promoting fair, for example, fair data principles, how we can encourage and enable um, good data management good practices in data management across all of our facilities.